Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome to our session about Backstage. Uh, just before getting started, uh, how many of you have heard about Backstage? Okay, quite uh, almost the full room. And how many uh, of you are using Backstage? Okay, not so many. And uh, well, on the just very few hands left, uh, uh, how many of you um, like Backstage? Still two, okay. Good. <laughs> so, well, hopefully we'll change that uh, in the talk today. Uh, so I'm Christophe Farget. Uh, I work at Red Hat and I'm a principal pro product manager. Uh, and I will pass it to my colleague. Hi everyone, I'm Valentina. I'm a principal technical marketing manager at Red Hat. So today we want to talk about the developer persona understanding. Uh, how many of you are developers? Okay, kind of half the room. So probably you already face some of the challenges or all of the challenges that we will cover today. We want to explore how we can face uh, these challenges in a different way with platform engineering and talking about backstage. So we'll talk about why backstage, what and how. But also we will go over the backstage architecture and how to uh, set up backstage. So we'll do two demos. One about setting up locally to start working on, uh, and the other one when we are working on a more enterprise-grade backstage and what are the things that we need. So we'll go a deep dive on software templates. And at the end, we also want to share what we have learned when working with customers, best practices, lesson learned, learns, and challenges. So as you know, all of us now, uh, software uh, is evolving constantly, right? Frameworks, languages, and from that, also different practices of software development, different roles, and that is affecting developers directly. Developers need to focus on building applications so they can add value into their business. But with technology evolves so the business, more requirements and more business needs. For example, to be uh, everywhere, right? To work with CI CD tools and automation. So we want to be efficient, we want to do more with less. And also we want those developers to, to be more productive as well. But the reality shows us that with technology evolves, there are more tools and then brings more complexity. So developers nowadays, they are overwhelmed by all the complexity of technologies. And it's not only me saying it, there are a couple of surveys from Stack Overflow, Overflow and Salesforce as well, looking into developer productivity and happiness. So as you can see here, 52% uh, of developers have a strong sense that productivity makes us happy. But also the lack of productivity, 45%, this makes us unhappy. We all want to produce more. We all want to feel that we are adding value and we are being effective in our jobs. So with this, it's affecting the productivity. 76% of companies said that cognitive love is really high and that is affecting directly on productivity. So if you're sitting, if you're a developer, you are seeing all these tools that you need to work, all these teams that you need to collaborate, and that is affecting productivity, how you focus. So what we can do about this? So platform engineering, it's one of our, uh, the top 10 strategic technology according to Gartner for this year. Um, in 2025, 75% of organizations are expecting to solve the problem with platform engineering and developers to bring more productivity by building self-service portals to really improve this situation. So with that, we want to propose talk about backstage to bring this productivity as the level it should be, to remove these barriers, to bring happiness into developers. So, but what is backstage? It's an open platform for building developer portals. Uh, it's on cloud native, cloud, uh, cloud native computer foundation is being uh, right now in an incubating just for a few years. Um, well, for us, yeah, several years already. Um, and what is, what is that doing is allowing those developers to focus by bringing those different tools into just one place. They really want to unlock 
that developer productivity and lowering the cognitive load. So we want happy developers to make happy code. So there are many, many communities, um, developers already committing into, into the source code, but also adopters. Many companies, yesterday I just saw a new company joining, many companies already adopting backstage. But what is backstage and how is making the, all this possible? So I want to talk about five components that makes backstage possible. First is a centralized software catalog. The main idea is, you know, how difficult it is to find out what is available on a company. There are many components that are all spread everywhere. But also, I want to make sure that whoever sees that components has their rights to do it. So RBAC is on place. But what I need is also extend this platform into my technology. So with these plugins are coming into place. The plugins will allow me to integrate what I need in order to succeed with my company guidelines from single sign-on, CICD, GitOps, and more. Software templates will allow me to create best practices and put it in one place so developers can build and deploy efficiently. Tech Docs, Imagine that you have one single pane of glass when you can find everything you need from your company guidelines, best practices, and much more. So the tech docs will allow us to do that. As well as searching all those components, everything from software libraries, websites, everything that I am creating in Backstage. Yes, um, so now I'm going to deep dive on each of these uh, uh, five main uh, uh, points of Backstage. So the first one is the software catalog. That's where you will be able to find everything uh, that you need uh, to know, or at least that the, the, your organization will uh, allow you to, uh, to see. So there could be any applications, libraries, uh, websites, even like clusters or um, uh, any kind of infrastructure if you, if you want to list a database or Kafka or anything else. Uh, so this is like re really great if you are just joining a company or you have someone joining your team, they will have uh, they will have a nice way of discovering what uh, what they can they, uh, what your uh, your team is using, and then uh, uh, you can import uh, lots of uh, uh, like any types, uh, even like APIs and uh, and anything and. Uh, uh, how to add uh, items to the uh, to the catalog that would be via YAML files. So this is great because that would be hosted on Git, um, uh, where it's more your source of truth, and then uh, you can always rebuild and uh, reimport uh, anything into the the catalog. So this is really one of the the powerful uh, feature. Uh, the second one will be uh, the plugins. So like uh, Valentina mentioned earlier, that's a, a good way to extend the platform. You have different type of plugins. Uh, the front end plugins will be kind of an interface to a downstream service. So for example, you have a, a CI or CD uh, tool, and, but you will have to, uh, to have uh, the view from backstage where the developers can find uh, everything into uh, like a, a one place. Um, and you have also backend plugins that would be allowing you to import data to the, uh, to the catalog or backstage. So uh, APIs uh, or like clusters or anything from, uh, for, for history of your pipelines, etc. So you can see that uh, there is a pretty big list of uh, uh, community plugins available. Uh, I was checking this morning and we're almost uh, uh, close to 200. That was 198 plugins. So the, uh, you have lots of plugins uh, from security, uh, CI, CD, uh, uh, really pretty much for, uh, for anything, especially all the, the, the major vendors will, uh, will have a plugin. Uh, um, at Red Hat, we have created about uh, 18 plugins, so they, were, they are also listed on the on the backstage uh, website if you are looking for the plugins. Uh, so this is definitely one of the critical uh, feature in uh, uh, in backstage. Uh, the third one, um, I will not deep dive too much on this one because Valentina will will do it in the demo later on. But that's uh, the templates that uh, what allows the platform engineers. Um, to provide a self-service for uh, for the rest of your uh, organization, uh, so especially developers, but that could be anyone else, to be able to create new applications or even provision some infrastructure. So that could be a database, a cluster, a namespace that you will uh, that you will need. Uh, so either you will need access and knowledge, but there that could be just via uh, 
couple of uh, metadata to fill and then automatically done for, uh, for the developers. Um, tech docs, uh, this is a way to keep your documentation or at least the technical documentation close to your source code. So the files will be in a markdown uh, format and that will be hosted on Git. So the, the developers or at least the, the technical team will tend to keep their uh, uh, documentation more up to date and they can use already their uh, favorite uh, tools for, uh, for that. So they can create a pull request and, uh, and update the, the documentation. And the last one, as um, uh, Backstage can collect lots of useful information, either via the plugins or the catalog, uh, there is a, a very extensive uh, search that you can use, and then uh, you can discover pretty much anything that you will, uh, that you will need. So same as a, um, a new person that just gets uh, onboarded to your, uh, to your team or your company will be able to access the search, just look for something or a keyword and see all the the applications or microservices that will already exist or, uh, or any kind of APIs. So that's a great way to, uh, to start and uh, save lots of time. And then we'll, uh, we'll start with the demo. So in the first demo, I uh, will just use the backstage CLI and uh, create a, just a vanilla backstage. So that will not contain really any plugin, uh, but you will see how uh, easy it is to, uh, to get started. Uh, big enough. So uh, we just have to run one command uh, that would be uh, to just like the create app uh, from uh, from backstage. Uh, so uh, I would just run that. I created already an app uh, just before the uh, the talk. So if it's taking too long with the uh, Wi-Fi, we can jump to the other one. Okay, so there, uh, what happened, that was just the CLI creating all the files that will be required to, uh, to create a backstage instance. So all the configuration files, all the source code or uh, uh, anything that is required. And then that's going to uh, do a good uh, uh, yarn install to install all the dependencies. Um, and then after we can just uh, execute and, and run it. So. Uh, uh, the best I got was about four minutes to install the dependencies. I'm sure you want to skip that part. Um, so we can let it run and I will just go to the uh, other tab, uh, which is exactly the same. I didn't do anything. That was just the command finished. And I would just do a yarn dev. So this will start my uh, instance, the, the local instance of Backstage. So we have to wait a few seconds to, uh, to, to finish loading. There we go. And then you can see I have a, like a developer portal uh, that just uh, as easy. So uh, uh, Valentina is going to deep dive on, a, on a, each of these uh, uh, sections there. So the, uh, the second demo that I would like to show you is how you can extend this, uh, this backstage with, uh, by adding extra plugins. So uh, there we'll have to do a bit of uh, uh, coding. Actually, I did it earlier for, uh, for saving some time. So I would just load my uh, WebStorm here. So what we have to do is to install the plugin. So in this case, I'm going to install the, pl uh, the announcement um, plugin. And uh, th uh, this comes in two parts. There is the backend plugin and the frontend plugin. So I have to install technically two plugins. So the first one will be with the uh, yarn add, and I will just add this one here. And so it's already in my package.json. And then I have to add it also in the code by just adding a new backend uh, line here with the plugin announcement. And then we have to do the same with the, the front end. So we can see the, uh, uh, the announcements that will be posted. And then we have to do also a yarn add with the, uh, uh, the plugin announcement there. And we have to load it um, also in backstage. Okay, so there we have to in, do the import. And then we just add it, we add a, a new route there that we, can, uh, that we can call. So in this case, what we had to do is to, to run two Yarn commands to install the backend and the frontend and about three lines of code. Uh, so the, that's so yeah, like pretty easy. So now if I go back to my terminal, I will just stop this one. 
And this is the the one the, the source code that I was just uh, showing you. So that would be the, just a regular vanilla backstage with one plugin. And then I will just go to the uh, the route with announcements. And then you can see that I have a new plugin. So um, you could go to the uh, uh, to one of the almost 200 plugins and just add anything that you will need. Uh, obviously, it's not limited to one plugins. If you your organization wanted to use the 200 of them, you could just add all of them. Um, that will be lots of configuration, but you can add uh, any uh, any plugins or for all the tools that you are uh, using but this is great because sometimes you can have like a legacy application that is using Jenkins maybe you want to migrate to something else so you can have both plugins and uh, and slowly migrate uh, your applications from one system to, uh, to another so uh, this was uh, the demo and we can just see if the the first one is finished downloading yes so this is uh, the one earlier uh, was taking a few minutes. So just to show you that everything works, uh, we just do the yarn dev. Okay, it's better if I go to the, uh, the folder. And then I will just execute again. That's going to complain that the announcements uh, route does not exist so there we go so this is the one we created earlier after waiting a few minutes and then i still have the announcement uh, plugin that does not exist on this instance uh, so this would be just the uh, the regular backstage that we created and then uh, we'll go to the next demo that valentino is going to uh, to show you yeah thank you that's great thank you okay let me see so Perfect. So, um, can I close this one? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So we saw how we can um, start playing with backstage locally. So I can start learning how uh, I can develop and add new plugins. Um, but after some time, you maybe want like take this into a next level uh, and have a more enterprise grade uh, backstage solution. So, for example, one of the things that you will look into is like security, right? How I can ensure that everyone has the right access um, to, to backstage. So here it's, um, we integrated with uh, key clock. So I already signed in, so I will just uh, go back to here. The other thing that I did, I customize it um, with the colors. So as you can see here, I have a different logo and different colors here. Um, this is something that is, so the backstage website is very well documented. So this, there is a branding section that you can go and you can change the colors, you can change the logo. It's just three lines of source code. Um, so with this, um, there are things that you may want. Let me put this into, um, copy something here before moving because I will show you something. Okay, put this into full screen. So you will want something on your homepage. So in this case, for example, I had some quick um, access so you can have like community links and also uh, developer tools as well as CICD tools or even the clusters access and here security tools. So you can add links, you can add icons um, to your configuration files. The other thing is um, that I have here, I have my catalog. Remember we talk about the centralized place to find our catalog. Here is a lot of the things I've been playing uh, during the morning to ensure everything was working. So I created a lot of components here uh, that all of these components are part of a microservices architecture. So I can support as many type of architecture types uh, such as, I don't know, Spring Boot, Quarkus, and Node.js, many tools with software templates. So these are the components I already created. I will show you how to do this. Um, the other thing I have as well, APIs, the APIs that I'm consuming. This is really useful for developers to know what are the APIs that they can access. 
as well as the tech radar. So if you want to know the adoption of different tools in your company, you can include, here, include this here. But now the fun part. So you probably are wondering like how these things works and what is that I can do. So software templates allows you, we said, right, to create best practices and put it everything in one place. The main idea is you will create uh, these software templates will be defining the build deployment process for your applications. And that will be determined for each particular uh, element here. So I already created some, but let's see how this plays. So I want to create a few with you. So I will just, let's create, I don't know, this front end application. So here I have uh, four steps. Three that I need to provide input. The last one is just for review. So the ones that I want to provide input, there are things that I have decided what is that I need to. So at the first, you will want to provide the GitLab. So I'm using GitLab for this, this is my repo. I want to provide the GitLab host. Uh, this is my organization as well, like the group where I am putting everything on it, and as well as my cluster. So this is my cluster API um, as well, that it where my application will be built and deployed. Also, the namespace on my cluster, so I am using OpenShift for this, and I am user one just for this uh, demo. So then uh, I am using an internal registry, but I can provide Quay or any other registry that you may want for this in order to store and pull your, your images, as well as uh, the image tag and the component name. The component way, name is what it will identify your application across backstage and in your cluster. So let's add, I don't know, here, um, I don't know, test, um, summit, here, so I can change that as well. So, and then I can review and I can create. So let me show you here. These are the different stages that my um, component from backstage needs to go in order to be built and deployed on my cluster. So as a developer, I didn't do much, as you can see. I just click, 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 went through that kind of wizard, right? That asked me things, um, and that's it. But there are things, if you have, in my case, I have a dynamic cluster. So this can run on different clusters, so that is variable. But if you're running your backstage in you know, a static cluster, it's always the same. You can hard code kind of the URL, and you don't need to ask the developer for it. So you can decide what are the input values that you want, depends on the variables that may change. Um, with this, I have my catalog created here. So this is the component, and I have many things here. So I have connected with the different plugins, so I can see this is a plugin that we have from, from OpenShift, which is a topology view, which allows me to see what is the current status of my application. So right now, it's scaling up, the image is still building, so I will show you just here one second. I have my pipeline here that is being created. It's a simple pipeline just for the purpose of this demo. But as you can see here, I didn't do much, right? It's just click, click, went through, and everything was created behind the scene. I have the pipeline, I have a pod here, a Kubernetes pod running. Um, this is a deployment object. I can see all the resources has been created from services to routes, everything is there. So now I want to show you, um, I can also see Kubernetes, so this is running, so that's why it's giving error. We will look into once it's, it's ready. So let me create another one, so you can have like a feeling of how this looks. Let's create this Quarkus application. So as you can see here, it's kind of the same. Just including the cluster, my user, the namespace, everything, and here I'm doing summit, changing the name, reviewing, and click on create. So as you can see, someone told me, oh, this is boring. Exactly, is it boring? So we wanted to make it boring. Someone it's too boring, but yeah, it's, you think about it, it's a repetitive process. Uh, you don't need to know about the complexity of CI/CD deployment options, resources, secrets, all of that. So with that, I want to show you how this works behind the scene. Okay, so 
this, uh, let me show you, when I click on create. So this is coming from in the application config on backstage, I will be saying this is my catalog from this repo. And it could be from a different repo of if maybe you have GitHub and maybe the developers have GitLab or Gaitia or any other one. So you can do that. Then let me see if I can go through the Git process. Okay, so here. So let me find that. Okay, so these are my software templates. So my software templates will have my showcase templates. These are the ones that you are seeing in the screen. Remember the Springboard, the Quarkus, all of that. So a backstage is reading from this file exactly. But then what else? So imagine, let's take a look at the front end template. So I will go back and then I will go to front end and then here is my template. So this is uh, the most important object. This is the one defining the UI, what you see on the different three stages. So let's take a look. So here I have provide information about the GitLab location, right? So when I come in here, for example, in front end, I have provide information about the GitLab location. I have a repo host, I have the repo group, exactly this. Provide information about the component. So if I click coming in here, I have information about the component. So the half part of this template, it will be all the UI input that I want to choose. And I can select if I want the type of object, the default value. Let me change to this branch because this is the one I'm using. Okay, so I can change here and decide, for example, uh, my default group, my host, my cluster ID, my namespace, everything I can define it from here. So this will depend, some people ask like how, what is specific and what is not? So that depends on your organization and how much you want to customize, right? How many software templates should I create, right? I have many type of applications and Java apps. So it depends on, again, on how much you want to customize, but the, mass, the, the, the much that you can, you know, make a, a global to everyone, the better because there will be less software templates that you can maintain. But again, take into consideration that those software templates will be used for each application. So whatever you change could affect others. The second part of the, so the first part of the template was the UI, the input. The second part is the processes, what's happening behind the scenes. So that is, let me show you again. Let's just do, um, test here really quickly. So we can see it again. Okay, do I have everything? Oh, let me go back and change this. Okay. So once I have the input, what I want to tell the template is what's happening. So this generating the source code, publishing the source code, all of this is defined on my template. So I have the publish the source code, register the source code, templating GitOps. So we'll go in details on this one. So first, what I want is the template source code is taking everything from my skeleton project. And this is the source code and the catalog info that we'll review with you in a second. Then it will be published this. So it will be creating a repository in the GitLab with the application name, with all the resources it needs. The second one, it will be register that component as a catalog info. So you can see all the components listed in the catalog. And then of course, we are using the power of GitOps to create these objects. So it's not backstage creating these objects. Backstage is taking everything and push it into, into a repo with the values that I need. And then GitOps is the one creating all these objects for me in the required cluster. So once I template it into GitOps, I look into the manifest and then I publish into GitOps. I can create all those resources and then at the end I will have an output. So this output that you see here is the output that if we go into here, 
we see into these links. So right now, these links, I am pointing into my cluster so the developers can go into the cluster if they want. So that's something that you can customize as well if you want to add more links or remove some of them. But uh, wait a second, you may be wondering where is this thing coming from? So this is coming from from my catalog. So if I go, I spoke about the skeleton, right? So this is my source code of the application. And then I have here, let me find that, my catalog information. So this is a backstage object where I define the component. This is all the characteristics from my component in my front end. So I have the tags, it has the pipelines that I want to explore in my cluster, deployments, everything that I need, and this is connected also with dev spaces. Okay, so this is all of this, right, that I can see here. Great. But I want to show you, so far so good? Yes? Okay. Okay, so I want to show you something else because one of the things that uh, for me was more challenging when I started with Sofa templates was about understanding all these variables passing through different files and how this works. So I want to show you that. We have time, right? We are good. I think we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. We're running? We have nine minutes. Nine minutes. Okay, I will show you quickly. It's only lunch. It's only lunch. I don't want to be in the middle of your lunch, of course. <laughs> so, uh, so for the manifest, uh, what Argo CD will look like, so I have my Argo CD definition, I have my build process, this is the build, this will be reading from the, my folder home pipeline, and in my folder home pipeline, I have everything to build my application. So, this, you will find this Pipeline files, right? You're probably familiar with this. But one of the things that are important is these values. So I am using Helm here, Helm charts, right? So the values I can provide any ones that I want, but also the values that you see, the variables, right? From line, for example, 17, these are coming directly from the templates. So what I am putting the GitLab URL, all of that, this is feeding from these values and then feed it into the manifest objects. And then the last one is um, the Helm application. This is the one that has all the deployments and everything with it. So also I want to show you quickly how it looks into Argo CD. So these are all the objects that I have created with you and before running and working. Here I have the build process and here I have all the, the manifests. So with that, I think I will pass it over yeah, to Christoph. <laughs> yes. So with this demo, you can see that uh, anyone in your organization, yeah, either if they're, they're new, they don't have necessarily the context of the, or like the, they don't know the tools and uh, necessarily what, the, what they're supposed to use, or even if it's someone that is uh, like really an expert in the uh, in the company, they can get started like very quickly. So I remember like in the past, I know how to create the webhooks, how to create the pipelines, but when I start a new project uh, at some point, when I did it like 10 times, I don't want to do it again. So having a tool like Backstage and the software templates, that is a time saving. So I can focus on my app only. So I know we are running out of time, but we still have two more slides to go through. So we'll go there quickly. So we have the demos. Uh, okay, so we are talking uh, about the best practices. Um, so if you are uh, going to jump in that adventure of platform engineering and using Backstage or any other uh, IDPs, you will have to treat your platform as a product. Because um, like you saw earlier, that was more, uh, when I used the CLI, that was uh, kind of a framework to create the, uh, uh, the Backstage instance. But after that, you have to continue to make it uh, uh, to continue to, uh, to make it live or uh, update it. And uh, uh, so you will have to create uh, your own pipelines and, uh, and make sure everything is always secure. So obviously security, that's something you should uh, start including right at the start. Uh, backstage is pretty open um, out of the box uh, for, for visibility. But if you are in a large organization, that's not necessarily what, uh, what you need. Um, find your personas. That would be also a big one. Um, backstage is, has been created for developers, but actually the platform is not necessarily only for developers. Uh, everybody in, in IT could, uh, could uh, use uh, Backstage. So that could be the infra team, uh, security team, uh, testing, or pretty much anybody. Um, if you don't know how to start, I would say start small, uh, just pick one software template. Uh, 
Spring Boot or JavaScript, anything. Don't try to create 200 um, uh, templates at a time because you will just fail. So just take one, get good at it, and then continue to iterate. If you don't like the software templates, um, if you prefer tech docs, then do it with uh, tech docs also uh, start there. But um, don't try to do everything because you can see uh, earlier, we have many plugins. You can do quite a lot from backstage, but if you try to go everywhere, uh, that would be very hard to, uh, to, uh, to succeed. Uh, and uh, the last one that would be try to keep only one developer portal in your organization. Don't try to create one for uh, team A, team B, or different departments, because um, the goal is to keep it easy to maintain and to, uh, to share that knowledge. Or if someone change from uh, one team to another one, uh, they can find that information. So if you have different portals, uh, that kind of defeat the, the purpose. And then the, the last slide would be the lesson learned and uh, the challenges. So uh, first one is great. And now I have a new platform engineering team. So what is it? Who owns it? Who is going to pay for it? Who is going to maintain it? How many people I need for this? Um, I've seen everything. Sometimes developers who are taking care of it. Some others are creating actually a new team, uh, the platform engineers, some others it's a, a mix of uh, different folks. There is one security, two DevOps, one dev. So they, they make a small team and they, they all work together. Uh, how many people, I will say that up to you. Uh, sometimes a team of one, uh, good luck. Otherwise more three to five. As I've seen some team is 20, 20, 20 people working on it. Um, so it, it just depends uh, how, how many plugins you want to manage and uh, what you want to do with the platform. And uh, to succeed, you need an adoption plan and developer onboarding. So you want to have people using the platform and uh, you need data in the, in the portal. So you, you have to work on that. Make sure that uh, you plan uh, ahead, otherwise you won't be uh, successful with it. Um, it's hard to keep Backstage up to date. Um, it's a very active community, so this is great. They have a monthly release, and that's great as well. You always inherit a new, a new features, bad fixes, but it's moving very quick, and uh, they have also uh, like breaking changes. So if you do that on your own, uh, then uh, by the time you fix a new release, you put it in your pipeline, test it, and you go to production, you have a new, uh, a new release coming, so that's just nonstop. Uh, and then it takes uh, time and effort. It's something live, so you have to, to take care of your portal and the plugins. Uh, the more plugins you add, the more you have to, uh, to maintain. So this is also uh, time consuming. And uh, uh, the last one is uh, talk to your team or make sure they have a way to give you feedback. Um, uh, not everybody will necessarily like the, the, the things you are all, like maybe they have other recommendations, so you want to have uh, either a plugin or a, a form or something for them to be able to reach out to the uh, to the platform engineers uh, to give you feedback and improve the platform. And then that's it. So thank you um, for coming uh, to our talk and during the, the lunch, uh, we have some QR code if you want to connect. I think we still have just a few minutes left for questions. So you can uh, ask now, otherwise we, uh, both of us will be at the booth. Uh, I think it's upstairs uh, at, the, at the solution showcase. So we can make a demo of uh, Backstage or the Red Hat offering that uh, we also have. Yeah, any questions? No? Good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, a question? Have two minutes. Yeah, of course. Just, Just one second. What do y'all do you work with? Oh, do you work with Backstage in your regular job? Are you running like a portal inside Red Hat or are y'all trying to productize this? Or what is your relationship with using Backstage? Yes, so, uh, uh, well, I do. Uh, I have a product at Red Hat, so I'm the product manager, and uh, it's based on Backstage. So definitely, we're very involved in the uh, Backstage community and uh, also for enterprises. So we have a commercial offering based on, on Backstage, and uh, we provide support, uh, RBAC, uh, dynamic plugins, lots of uh, extra features. Uh, uh, everything we do uh, is mostly uh, like plugins, and they are all open source, so anybody can uh, can, uh, can use them. They're all listed in the, in the plugins page. You know, on the backstage.io website. Yeah, it's called uh, Red Hat Developer Hub, and we can give you a demo as well in our booth if you have interest. Otherwise, we do have a team, uh, platform engineers uh, within Red Hat also setting up a platform for uh, for the, the people internally uh, to, uh, to consume it. So we are definitely involved with uh, with Backstage. Yeah, any other questions? Of course, pleasure. Any other questions? I think we have one, uh, one yeah. there. The enterprise I work at, um, ownership for 
services and products across teams, we try to use aliases. Is there a way to use aliases when you look at those template YAML files and you assign an owner? So as people move around, we can we can keep those products with the teams versus the individuals. Yeah, so we are currently working on improving uh, that aspect. Um, uh, for uh, what you just mentioned, if someone is moving and uh, how like uh, someone else could, uh, could take over or updates, but also to track uh, what are the components creating with a, so, uh, like a, with a specific template. So uh, we mentioned a few technologies earlier, but let's take uh, Spring Boot. And um, um, in your organization, you have 200 components where, or like applications creating from the, what that template. If that template is, uh, you want to track uh, how many components or which one, uh, 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 are up to date and the others were uh, a bit lagging from uh, uh, from the the latest updates on the template we're working on that too uh, so you uh, you have a way of tracking that information it's not out of the box in uh, in backstage yet but this is something that is coming yeah